Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to VUE DC. This is our March edition. Uh, we have some special guests, guests today uh, from Politico, and uh, they're going to be talking about uh, web accessibility. So we'll introduce them here in a moment. Um, but first, <clears throat> uh, us, the organizers, uh, Ben, and start off with you. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Ben. I work at Delphi as a senior developer experience engineer. And some of you might know my, my work on the Vue core team, uh, primarily with docs. And yeah, uh, excited to be here. Tracy, on to you. Tracy Holenka, I'm at Bloomberg Industry Group and in News Engineering. And um, yeah, I'm a web application architect. And I'm Christian Guerreri. I'm from Politico uh, and I'm a uh, lead uh, engineer. Hey, y'all. I'm Jack, uh, also at Politico, also uh, lead engineer. Great to be here. <laughs> so um, I looked at our latest meetup count. We're up to 1,032 members, which is super, super awesome. Uh, thank you all for still continuing to join us um, even during COVID. Uh, obviously, check out viewdc.io. Uh, we have all these links there. Um, but uh, for those who don't know about the Discord channel, it's a great place to go. Um, a lot of people are usually in the view, the official view land Discord uh, group, um, but ViewDC is a great place um, uh, because it's a much smaller uh, community. And um, that also means you get a lot more one-on-one -on -one attention. So if you have like a problem or something you wanna share, um, uh, that, that would be awesome to have people to continue to join us there. Um, I'm sure most of you know about the meetup group uh, since that's probably how you got here, but also check us out on Twitter and all of our meetups uh, are usually recorded, uh, including this one, and they end up on YouTube. So upcoming events, um, there is actually, I noticed that, that viewschool.io uh, is doing a free view three masterclass this weekend. So uh, hoping people can check that out. Uh, April 14th is ViewConf US. It is free. It's all virtual. Uh, so uh, hoping everyone um, can join that. But if you can't, uh, we're going to be doing a recap the week afterwards uh, here. <clears throat> and so uh, just as always, we're always looking for speakers. Um, you're going to hear from two people today who um, have not spoken at Vue. Well, I think Evan has actually spoken at Vue DC once before. Um, but uh, please reach out, reach out to us, uh, viewjsdc at gmail.com. Even if you just have an idea and you're not really um, certain if you, it's something you wanna talk about, we're still interested in hearing from you and we can, we can help you out with uh, making that happen. Uh, this is um, uh, a place to give you that opportunity. Um, uh, I believe we still have JetBrains licenses. Uh, so we usually raffle one off if you're interested. Um, just uh, give a give your email address to um, Ben Hong um, in the panelists, uh, and uh, he'll add you to the list. So, uh, with mm, further ado, uh, let's do trivia. <laughs> oh, oh, nice! Oh, and who are our first losers? Yeah, nice. get that spin cat. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, congrats to all participants. Congrats to me mostly for making this <laughs> That was trivia. actually a good job. Good job, Jack. <laughs> Thank you. Good trivia. Um, all of the, secretly all of those were obviously view themed. It's just up to you to figure out in which way they were view themed. <laughs> um, well, it's been a good view DC. Good night, y'all. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I will pass to Chris who can introduce Evan. Oh, uh, well, I don't have much to say. Um, a lot of it is in the meetup uh, event listening listing, but uh, we're really, really happy to have Evan and Liz here today from Politico. Uh, they have, we all as a whole front end team at Politico have spent um, the majority of last year uh, with a new accessibility initiative uh, to make the web a better place within the Politico domain. Uh, so really looking forward to this, um, and I hope everyone enjoys it. Uh, off to you guys, Evan and Liz. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, to those listening and to those in the future, at some future point, listen to the recording. Uh, my name is Evan Sanderson. I am the software and uh, development manager for the front end engineers at Politico. Liz, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Liz. I am a front end developer at Politico as well. Um, I've been there for, I think, 
Coming up on two years in June. Uh, we're going to be talking to you tonight about web accessibility and generally speaking, how we've come about uh, a little bit of a transformation on our team around web accessibility. Um, so yeah, you're going to hear from me a lot to start off with. Uh, then you're going to hear from Liz. Uh, so you're going to hear my voice for a while and we're going to take a little pause and then we're going to have Liz do some more implementation details. Um, a, 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 brief, a brief caveat before we begin. Liz and I are not in any way accessibility experts. We are uh, just people part of this journey. Uh, so yeah, uh, we're not accessibility experts. Uh, we're not accessibility trainers. We're not accessibility consultants. We are but neophytes on this long journey. Uh, anyone who has worked on the web and worked in web accessibility knows that it's a really, really wide topic that has a lot of, um, uh, has a lot of nuance to it. Um, so this is in no means a um, sort of, this is how you must do it, or uh, you know we have some expert hidden knowledge that we're unveiling to you. This is just one way of sort of approaching this problem space. The things that I talk about are gonna be a lot more philosophical in some ways, and a lot more um, programmatic. And um, Liz is gonna talk more about implementation and more code things. So with that said, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm, absolutely miserable at doing this so just while evan's setting up um just want to tell everyone if you have any questions at all um please feel free to throw it into the q a and um we will pass them along to evan and liz okie dokie i'm going to share my screen oh no this is the wrong thing i'm sharing this is i'm sharing it with new people uh i'm going to present with this button love um so yeah just to set the stage a little bit, um, this is the story of Politico front end, the front end team and accessibility. It's going to be about like what we've learned and what we're still working on and how we've gone about uh, in, in this in this area. Um, one thing that I'll ask of you, just as uh, Chris mentioned, um, I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, the thing that I would ask is if you uh, are in the audience right now and you've had experience working in web accessibility. I'd like to know uh, a few things from you. Just You can just write them in the chat whenever it strikes you. Your, I'd love to know your experience working in web accessibility, whether you have or not, what that's been like, um, and whether or not, um, and how that experience has gone. Um, generally speaking, very anecdotally, do you feel like you have a grasp of it? If your team has a grasp of it, do you feel like it's something you've ignored? Um, no, there's no judgment. This is not a value judgment on whether one way is good or bad. I just love to get a sense from the people who are who are joining us um, a little bit about your experience in that vein. So this is the overview of what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna do introductions, we've already done that. Um, we're gonna lay out the problem area. We're gonna describe in broad strokes the steps we took to address the problem. I'm gonna do a little demo of a screen reader. For those of you who may be very familiar with screen readers, some of you may not, never have heard of screen reader before. Um, we're gonna use um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna use a, a native screen reader to, to Mac to, to do a little bit of digging around. We'll have a break for any questions that have come up. Um, and just a moment to sort of pause and catch our breath. I'm gonna pass it over to Liz at that point. She's gonna um, move into the overview of technical implementations. She's gonna look at something called web hints and talk about a web hint dashboard we created that helped us. She's gonna look a little bit at our view accessible select GitHub repo, which is a publicly accessible GitHub repo for a, um, a particular view component that we created to help us get some, get some problems solved. And then we're gonna look at an example of a mix in we created, just a, just a, a little sample of, of, stuff, of stuff we've done. And then we'll open it up for questions and comments. So that being said, let's let's take a move on. So who are we? Politico is a news and information services organization. I'm sure you've heard lots of talk about that from my from my wonderful colleagues who who work at BDC. Um, we're a, quite a small team of front end engineers, um, and we work on a variety of, of of mostly business to business applications as well as consumer side code, which lives on um, Politico.com mostly. Um, so it's, it's, it's a small team. The people you see here, this is kind of a cool little thing that was put together for us. Um, that's sort of a, an overview of the team as like a, as like a high school class diorama. Um, we're, we're about a, a, we're maybe an eighth of this group. So it's a, it's a small team. And I mentioned that because um, I don't want you to feel as though you have a very, a lot of us work on small teams and you can be small, but mighty. 
Um, you can make a big impact with just a small amount of people, even just making small incre incremental improvements. That's going to be a theme that we come back to. Um, there are no accessibility experts among us. None of us were, um, you know, trained to do this. Um, we all have web development training, but none of us are specifically in the accessibility space. Um, and, and we really knew to, to sort of intro the problem as it stands, we really knew that we had accessibility problems and the, 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 it surfaced to us because we have a dedicated QA team that would um, take dedicated time to test the applications that we were creating and the features that we were writing. Um, and, in it specifically according to the WCAG guidelines. I'm gonna go ahead and actually unshare my, unshare my presentation here and just move over. Uh, I got this little bar here, I'm gonna back up, weep. Um, this is the WCAG guidelines um, for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with it. Um, WCAG is the web content accessibility guidelines, I think. Um, it's one of those things where you, we always say WCAG guidelines, but it has the guidelines in it and it's just a, it's just a kerfuffle. Um, this is um, a bit of the source of truth on how things should be implemented in terms of accessibility. You can see here, this is a sample page for the ARIA label. Um, and it looks like any technical documentation might look um, quite uh, voluminous and um, a little bit, frankly, hard to parse. I don't think the documentation is terribly good. And that's one of the issues um, that we faced a lot. I will talk about a little bit more. Um, the documentation for how to do this is kind of all over the place. WCAG is sort of the author authoritative um, source of that, but it is still a little bit, um, again, a little all over the place. You can see they have things like um, example code that, that is, um, might be useful, but none of it really takes into account the um, complexities of things like JavaScript frameworks, right? This is all as if you were just coding HTML and, and, and plain HTML and plain CSS. Uh, so, so there's a, a level of abstraction that's missing and a level of complexity that's often missing. These are very simple examples. So that, that's, one of the, that's one of the sort of blockers for understanding how to do this properly. I'm gonna go back to my, uh, my presentation now. I'm just gonna take a look briefly at the chat just to see. Uh, long, so Brian Strong has said he's long time dealing with 508, especially while I was at WMATA. Max accessibility texting. Yeah, yeah, I hear you on that one. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope that you, uh, I hope that this presentation kind of rings a, is, um, oh, two, and two blind testers, fantastic. Um, yeah, I hope this really, this presentation kind of um, uh, resonates with you. Um, so what were the major problems and issue areas that we faced? The big one for us, we did not have the tools to properly measure accessibility. So our entire worldview of how accessibility was um, parsed to us was through QA tickets, um, meaning it was purely reactive. And even, even beyond that, um, the means by which we assessed whether an accessibility ticket was complete or not were, were actually fairly inaccurate and, and sort of not super standard. And what I mean by that is we, we didn't have access to, we use Macs, uh, and we didn't have access to screen readers like JAWS or NVDA that people who are uh, blind using the internet would actually use. So we were reliant on things like voiceover, which is common, but but not part of the not the largest market share of that of that tooling, um, and so we often found ourselves getting bugs, trying to test them in the meager means we had available, and then sort of solving it, and then it coming back and being partially solved, and a lot of mishigas going back and forth between the the QA team and our team. That was one one problem area. Um, our developers didn't have a place to go to find shortcuts for common problems that they were facing. Um, we had, like I mentioned, uh, internet tools, right? We, we could look at WCAG, we could look at um, Ally Slack uh, uh, forums or, or what have you, but we didn't have anything internally built to say, this is a very common problem we have with forms, with input boxes, with uh, multi-selects, for example. We had external um, information that was again kind of all over the place, but nothing that was consolidated about common problems that we were facing as a team. And so that was a really big issue for us. We didn't have any place to point new developers specifically to, to say, oh, you're running into a problem with a search page. 
well, this is a place that you can go where we've, we've collated that information. It just, it just wasn't part of the, our parlance. And the other, the other issue, and, and, and this is sort of the, the larger uh, philosophical issue, as I mentioned, is that accessibility tasks were seen by our team as a burden and a chore rather than an engineering problem. When I started on the path, um, a, a little bit of a rewind here, I was asked by our uh, chief architect to kind of take on the accessibility, what we called it accessibility czar, which is just a fancy title of someone to kind of think about accessibility broadly speaking. Uh, and this happened about, well, I would say six or seven months ago. And one of the problems that I uh, read about, I, I sort of dove into a bunch of research and talked to a bunch of people who are in this space. And this is one of the things that comes up the most often. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a, um, touchy subject because we all feel like we should do accessibility, but we don't really want to do accessibility because we are not the users often, um, us developers, I mean. So when we build applications and we build, uh, when we, we code generally speaking, we have an understanding of the way a user would use it. And, and we can very easily validate that understanding by just looking at the thing that we built and clicking around on it. But it's very different for someone who is um, uh, has, visit, has, has vision impairment. Um, uh, it, it's very, very different. So, so it's often a real burden and a chore. It doesn't feel to many developers like real work. Uh, and that problem um, underpinned a lot of the other problems that we faced in the sense that because we didn't take pride in doing this well, we didn't create documentation around it because we just wanted to get through it as quickly as possible and not think about it anymore. And because we didn't want to do this, um, we didn't really push to get any tooling that would allow us to do it just wasn't anyone's job and no one really for lack of a better term cared enough uh, until it was made someone's job I, i'm not saying that i'm like a saint that came in and was like i'm gonna i'm gonna be the moral compass it was literally told to me that this is something we need to be doing and i agreed um but but i think that step of having it be someone's job to think about this or to to think just even a little bit more deeply about it made a big change so what are the major victories that we scored? Knowing all of this, doing all of this, this sort of preparation work, kind of assessing the space as we, as we saw it. Um, fast, moving forward into space, what are the things that we were able to do that helped mitigate these, these problems? So the first thing is that we worked on more robust documentation. Um, we had, we, one of the things that I really, really wanted to do was to create a corpus of information for um, thinking as if I was a new developer. Uh, what are the things that I would need to know in order to properly um, get my job done from an accessibility standpoint? Um, that included, uh, we, we hubbed that in Confluence and that was a conscious choice for, for me. I mean, obviously we're gonna hub things uh, in, the, in the space where they get hubbed, but I wanted it to be documentation in the same way that other engineering documentation that we had of, available was. I didn't want to set, set it apart, put it, push it somewhere else. This was an engineering problem, right? This was a problem akin to uh, you know, building an API. And I wanted it to, to exist in that same space um, as, a mental, uh, as a mental model. So we, I started to work on the, the kinds of documentation that I think that might be really helpful. One of those things was an accessibility standardization document. That just meant common UI patterns and how to ensure that they're accessible. For uh, This was very Politico specific, for example. I'm not, this may be extrapolate, we might be able to extrapolate this to other organizations, but we really wanted to focus on the stuff we did every day, really dummy stuff. Like, like we often have a button or some such and the button has an icon in it and the icon has no label or, or alt text. And so it flat, it, it's totally inaccessible. You have no idea what you're pressing on if you're using a screen reader. That's the kind of thing that would go in the standardization. Always have this, right? Um, we created a cheat seat, a, a cheat. That's a hard thing to say. A cheat sheet. Is, which is, was a, let, a list of questions for developers to check that their work um, was not building into common accessibility pitfalls. This was just a way, almost like a PR check kind of thing, like a way to be like, okay, I'm about to PR my code. Uh, this is just a feature that I'm working on. Really quickly, like, what are the things that we always do wrong? <laughs> kind of similar to standardization, but more about like just quick hits, just like a, a quick thing to, to consult. And then the final documentation, amongst other things that aren't mentioned here was open questions. Just a documented place for us to pose questions where we're like, I don't know how to do this. Like, and we and we talk about it and like, no one knows how to do this. And, and maybe it's not resolved and that's okay. But at least then it didn't become that thing where 
a question gets posed in a Slack channel or a whatever in a, in a meeting and it gets lost to the ages and then you have to return to it months later and there's no record of the grappling of that question. Again, very similar to other kinds of things you may do like um, creating ADRs or whatever it, it, for developer documentation. I wanted this to be, um, to be standardized. I wanted it to live in the place where we did our engineering work. One of the huge things that really helped us, and I think it was a, a bit of a turning point, uh, I, I think, um, I kind of asked the team what we felt like we needed from an accessibility standpoint. And what we what was echoed time and again was, we just want to talk to someone who really knows this stuff. Not read about it, not um, assume things, and, and, and not depend necessarily on the QA team's um, authority on this, which they have as, as QA as a QA team, but really a, a sort of a third party that does this day in, day out and understands it and has empathy for it and can help skill build and more importantly, kind of help coalesce our efforts around uh, accessibility work. Uh, so I kind of reached out to a bunch of different people and I found this wonderful, wonderful woman named Leonie Watson, who is a uh, British developer who happens to be blind actually. Um, and uh, she does a lot of great engineering work and, and particularly engineering work around accessibility and around um, making the web more accessible, but just generally great. She's just a great engineer um, and contacted her and she has a company in, in the UK um, called Tetralogical. I encourage you to look it up. They're fantastic. Um, and I reached out to her and, and actually the first thing that I did was just have a conversation with her. Just, she just wanted to talk to me and I just, we just chatted about accessibility and about what it meant and how I could be better as a, someone who was trying to push my team to do this better. And it was really, really eye-opening. The thing that she harped on again and again was, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be better than you were the day before. A little bit better, like incrementally better. And that approach um, helped take this um, huge thing that was very scary to me and make it a much more manageable thing. If I just am, a, if we just add a little bit more documentation, if we just have one slight victory, like it, that's great. That's that's enough for now. And just keep building on that momentum. Um, I think that there was some really, really eye-opening uh, implementation details that she revealed to us based on her experience. Um, uh, we gained a lot more folk, uh, confidence in making calls about what was correct behavior for accessibility. This is really, really important because when we got bugs, and, and, and this may happen to some of you who, who've worked in this space, when we got bugs around accessibility, many of them were opinions about usage rather than actual bugs. And what I mean by that is if a thing doesn't have an ARIA label, that's a that's just wrong, right? Like it needs to have an ARIA label because otherwise an icon needs to have an alt text, for example, because otherwise you just have no, like you, there's no way for someone using a screen reader to understand what that thing is. That's, that's a bug. But having focused shift, for example, so if, if any of you know about focus shifting, shifting focus of, of, of uh, tab focus, essentially, after an action is takes place, that's not always a bug. That's just an opinion about where someone's focus should go on the page after an event happens. It's, in a, it's a, a logical leap to say, uh, this person does this, then their focus should go here. Not a bug, again, but an opinion about the way the site should be utilized for someone who is using a screen reader. And this uh, accessibility tra training, more than anything else, helped identify those areas where we were uh, facing opinions rather than bugs. It didn't mean that we wouldn't fix them, but it allowed us to make informed decisions about how we would fix them and how we would prioritize those things. Again, usually the corpus of accessibility problems is humongous and it's really hard to kind of like just get your bearings on that. And this helped us kind of separate the wheat from the chaff based on a criteria that we created. And that was another piece of documentation that we created from this, this experience. A quick anecdote about our, our training with Leonie Watson is that uh, she talked about how um, the difference between automated testing and, and, and user testing and how automated testing is great, but it really only can catch like 30% of things because an automated test can, um, can catch uh, things like um, alt text missing but it can't catch whether the alt text is right. And she mentioned a very famous example for the London Underground, a uh, London Underground map on one of the main government sites had an alt text, but the alt text was chickens for many years. So for people using a screen reader, they would go to the London Underground map and, 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 and it would just read chickens, which 
it would have passed an automated test, but it wouldn't have been useful for those people. Um, and so the last thing I'll mention is in this sort of wins category is getting access to NVDA in Parallels. Um, Parallels is sort of like a, a thing that lets you run Windows on a Mac, lets you run a virtual machine that like kind of allows you to have Windows running uh, on your Mac. And, and the reason that was important for us is because we really wanted to, um, after doing a bit of research, use the, um, use the screen reader that was most tied to our common use case. Um, and, and it's very, very close pairing in, in the industry right now between JAWS and NVDA. NVDA has in fact surpassed JAWS because it's almost, it almost has feature parity, um, but JAWS is very expensive. So that was one of the things that was blocking us was um, JAWS was a very expensive software. We didn't have enough license for it to really have developers use it. Um, and we just asked the QA team, what would you feel about moving over to NVDA for your testing? A lot of people use it. It's very feature, it has very close feature parity. Um, and this way we could use NVDA as well. And we could have parity between what you were drawing up as bugs and what we were testing in our, in our application. So that was a huge win for us. Now we just boot up Parallels. We boot up NVDA. It's a very quick process for the most part. Uh, if anyone who's used Parallels, you know, it's a real resource hog. Um, but this way we can actually like validate the things that we are testing and like really match them one-to-one -one with both QA and most people's experience using a very common screen reader. And you can see here in this GIF that this is a, an example of us using, um, of us going on one of our, our major sites on a, a QA environment um, and navigating and the screen reader is sort of reading the stuff as it happens. This is very, this is this is sort of what NVDA looks like. We're not going to- I, I just yeah. wanted to hit home here. Um, yeah, as, as Evan mentioned, JAWS is very expensive. It's a, a thousand plus, I think, uh, per license. Um, NVDA is free, but it requires Windows, and Parallels is is not expensive. It's it's actually rather cheap, if I remember right. So yeah. it was very easy to give give everybody uh, who is on a Windows box uh, access to this, which was great. Yeah, it, it was it was a big win for us. That was a that was a really good. Uh, ooh, I'm trying to look at the chat. Um, all right, whatever. I'll go back to sharing. Um, okay. So yeah, so again, as Chris mentioned, like it was a huge win for us because we had been, we had kind of, we kind of changed our thinking from like, oh, could we, we have to like share a JAWS machine and like, how are we going to do that? And like, it's, we kept having bugs come back because we were using different software and just kind of like doing a little bit of extra research to make this logical leap to be like, oh, we could just use NVDA. And then all we need to do is have people have, have access to Windows um, was like a, an enormous win for us. It was really, really nice. Um, so yeah, uh, highly recommended if you are going to go through this process. NVDA is a great tool. I mean, literally, you could just if you have a Windows machine, just go and download it. It's totally free. You can just start using it um, and kind of test and play around in your in your applications and see how they are. So speaking of screen readers, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a demo of a screen reader right now. Um, this is going to get a little cacophonous. I warn you, uh, screen readers tend to be pretty chatty, obviously, because what's happening there is that. The the the, app, the the screen reader is literally reading every single thing that you do on a page. Um, imagine you were using it again. Imagine you were you were accessing the internet or your computer, uh, and you had you 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 couldn't use you know the mouse. Uh, you had to use your keyboard, and you you were vision impaired, either fully blind or or have impaired vision. So um, it's going to get a little chatty. Uh, I encourage you if you'd like, you can follow along. If you're using a Mac, you can go ahead and try this. Again, it's going to get like. It'll, it's going to be loud. It's okay. We'll get through it. Um, and um, I'm going to I'm going to stop. I'm going to sort of get out of this view, and we're going to activate it. And then we're going to look at a we're going to look at Politico.com and kind of navigate around just to see what it's like um, to to have a screen reader reading. To, I, I found the experience extremely empathy building. Um, if that's a term uh, that it kind of allowed me to like understand once I started using screen readers a little more to both do testing and just kind of like validate things and in, in applications like um, it really made me understand uh, how difficult it can be to do simple things like add things to carts and do searches and stuff on the internet for people who who don't have uh, the use of their vision um, okay so we're gonna go ahead and do that so the way to do that is you go to um, your little Mac icon here to, to preferences system preferences and you can see I already have it on the accessibility tab here because I was testing this out. Um, but we're going to go back just to show you where that is. You have this little little icon of a, of a human being. Click that. And then you just click enable voiceover. It's going to start Welcome talking. to voiceover. 
VoiceOver speaks descriptions of items on the screen and can be used to control the computer using only your keyboard. There you go. So it says if what it does on the tin. Use VoiceOver. Press the V key now. So I'm going to click if use to learn how to use voice voiceover. Over, press voiceover on system preferences, accessibility window, toolbar. I'm going to go over to politico.com. Policy, political news, politico, Google Chrome window, Google accessibility Prezi, Google's. You are currently I'm going to use my tab key. I'm using my option, keyboard right now. Control, this is a space. skip to main to content press button. Press control, Just common window, sites for politics, policy, uh, political keyboard news, navigation. Politico, Google Chrome, visited link, politico, banner, Chrome has new window. You are currently on a head link. hitting tab Maxine. again. List four items. Here we go. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press control, option, space. Great. So you can see how chatty it was just to start off, um, how much information you get just to start off. It can be really daunting, especially with sites. Uh, if you ever go to amazon.com, it's a good example. It has an enormous number of nav bar options and to, and to sort of get through things. Uh, Brian Strong, to everyone, that speech was slow to what I witnessed. It, it understands Zoom enough to be able to read out the chat. That's pretty cool. Um, that, that's actually the first time I've seen that ad. That's that's actually that really awesome. awesome. That's pretty wild. Um, you can link, see here the agenda link pro. I'm I'm tabbing through uh, link. to click this elements. Link. Open search form toggle button. S I hit enter. Store, it opens this field. Enter search term. It's you reading out the, the element. You enter text in this field toggle. and whatever um, semantic information it can understand about that element. Um, Stop and I can continue to tab web content, politics, web content, link, link, to go through link, these links. Link, leaving, leaving, there link. are Senator shortcuts that I can use link, to move link, through link, the applications, Apple link, Apple link, um, such as NVDA uses H for headings. There's, link, there's a bunch of link, shortcuts I can use to link, get to, to Senator, navigate link, throughout the page Congress, more effectively. In mass shootings. And I'm going to turn it off. You now. are currently on a link. Voice over off. There we go. There we go. So that's essentially... Um, a little tiny taste of what it's like to use a, a screen reader. And that is voiceover on, um, on a native tool for Mac. Uh, we, we found that about 10% of people use voiceover in Safari and, and, and the rest is you, you generally split half and half between using JAWS and using NVDA, specifically NVDA and Firefox is a very common combination. Um, so I'm gonna take a pause there. There's a lot of information. Uh, I'm gonna take a look through chat and see if there's anything uh, to bring up. <laughs> Jack is saying he really wants to spam messages here to see if they get read out. They would be. Um, um, and yeah, so so as Brian brought up, one of the really interesting things that we noticed when we worked with um, our accessibility trainer was she had us build uh, application, like, so, like miniature applications while we were in the session. And then she was like, I'm going to um, navigate your applications now using my screen reader. And the speed at which her screen reader spoke to her was staggering. Because as you can imagine, um, there is so much content to get through and she has gotten used to parsing that information very quickly and getting to where she needs to go and doing the action she needs, the, the, the sort of uh, primary paths for various websites and applications. It was like, as fast as that was, it was so, so much faster. And, she, and, and it was really, 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 really impressive um, to see, and, and really, again, empathy building, like to see like, oh, wow, like this is really, um, this is how someone uses the internet using the screen reader, which I had not experienced before. Um, yeah, it was it was honestly like for like I could not understand anything coming out of it. I had to usually like mm -hmm. look at the text, like that's yeah. <laughs> being output. And yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's if it's related. You know, they say like when when you're blind, um, all of your other senses like become more powerful, quote quote. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's that's a factor there as well. Yeah, I, I just think it's one of those things where she has to get good at it to, to, to be better at it or to, to get used to it because, you know, most people use the internet for tons and tons of stuff. Um, and, and she's a developer and at Mr. Funk, Mr. Funk's great name. <laughs> it made me laugh. Uh, anybody heard of Serenade? It's a voice of code for programming. Found out about it this week. That's awesome. I, I wouldn't be shocked if, if she's experimenting with that. I, I highly recommend you go look up Leonie. I'll type her name in the chat. Leonie, ooh, Leonie Watson. Uh, check out her stuff. She read some blogs about accessibility things. She's awesome. She's an awesome lady. Um, so yeah, any any props you can give her are great. Um, okay, so I'm going to move over now. I'm going to I'm going to shut up uh, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we're going to move over to Liz, who's going to talk about some of the other more implementation detail oriented things um, that are uh, were part of our efforts. Liz, take it away. 
Thanks, Evan. Um, That's a hard act to follow. Um, let's see. Can y'all see my? Looks good. Okay. Yep. Let me present. Um, so I'll go through some of our um, applications and some of the things that we use to make um, developing accessible features and components easier, especially particularly in view. Um, actually, I don't really even need to present because I'm just going to be looking at the pages. Um, so we use a thing called Web Hints. And Web Hints is a, let's see, uh, it's a tool that scans web pages um, for common accessibility bugs. It does a lot of other things. We're primarily using it for accessibility. I think there's like a performance. Um, there's there are some other things that web hints can do, um, but we're focusing mainly on using it for accessibility. Um, it it scans a page and just pulls out some basic um, like scans a page for basic accessibility. They're checking if your images have alt text. Um, things like uh, ARIA labels, if buttons don't have a text, they're looking for a label for that button. Um, and then some proper HTML syntax. Um, if you have uh, an LI element outside of um, a UL element or like that's not the child of a UL element, it will tell you like this is not right. You shouldn't be <laughs> um, using this this way. Um, and then they also do color contrast, which has been really helpful for us. Um, we. So I'll show you all the, um, the website for Web Hints. Um, we use the API and we've set it up to run daily on some of our pages on our um, testing environments. So it's scanning a few of our pages for each of our like applications. And um, we take all of the information they give us. It basically generates like um, arrays of errors that, that it catches. And we'll, we've created this dashboard to kind of track our the number of accessibility errors that web hints can catch over time. Um, this is fun. It kind of does look like there's a downward trend. Um, some days spikes and some doesn't. Um, and this is very specific to Politico. So, um, but we've got the different types of errors here, which has been helpful. A lot of them are color contrast. Um, and the use the really interesting and helpful thing that I found that web hints can do is that it'll tell you what the error is and then it'll give you a piece of the like where it is in your code so it makes it super easy to track down um, where you need to make a change um, and then it'll also give you a link to the page that that was on um, which is even more helpful um, it will show you these i did a, a little sample you can like do a sample run if you don't want to like start using web hints if you want to just see if it's going to be useful for you you can run web hints on any um, public URL. So um, let's see. On the home page, there's this little um, input where you can just like put your URL. I ran it on the New York Times homepage um, and it puts out a report like this. And this is like, you can do all of this just from the browser. Um, and it'll tell you what, like there are 17 hints, it calls it like color contrast um, errors and it will tell you where on the page they were. Um, it takes a little bit of time, which is why I didn't run it from the get go. I can show you what that looks like, but I won't like sit through it <laughs> and wait for it to load. But basically it just like takes a little time to scan the page. Um, we have it configured to where we're only showing this accessibility box and we're only dealing with the accessibility bugs. I think um, it's only fair to run this against Politico after you finish. Okay, it. okay. Um, let's see. It just takes, it's gonna take a really long time. I think one, because my internet is notoriously really terrible. Okay, um, you can come back to it. <laughs> it's, there's a lot, it's, it's working hard though. Um, let's see. I'll let that run and continue to talk about our dashboard and how we use web hints. Um, so we've set this up to run every day, every morning, it will generate a report of all of our, the pages that we're looking at in our applications. Um, we also have this configured in each of our repos so that we can, um, when we're developing locally, we can actually take our, like we can run our local um, like code, run our code locally and compare our changes that we've made to what's on our testing environments. So like if we're making changes that would affect accessibility, um, we would have two reports generated 
and we could see where those changes in accessibility were made, whether we're making more errors, we're causing more errors, or if we're fixing something. So that, that's been really helpful, I think, um, when we're making bigger changes to our sites, to our code. Let's see. Okay. Um, we also have a couple of um, packages where we have gathered some of the more common um, accessibility patterns, common functions that will help us, mix-ins that will help us um, make our components more accessible. Um, an example of that, let me see, first of all, the Politico one is done, not yet. Um, so for instance, can y'all see, is this text big enough to see? Um, yep. Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> um, so we have this uh, reveal ARIA message. In this pattern, we would use this in, for instance, in a form where someone uh, put an invalid input. Um, I can show you an example here. Um, and I'll turn my screen reader on in a minute, but I kind of just want to talk through um, when we should hear the message and then you'll, I'll demonstrate. So for this form specifically, we don't want to let someone create a new folder with the same name as a folder that already exists. So we can see, oh, that was, that one did not exist. <laughs> New list, okay. So we can see the error come here, uh, but someone who uses a screen reader wouldn't necessarily get this error. They wouldn't have any indication um, and we would have to uh, program that in. So this, we use this um, function here to essentially like add a screen reader message and remove it when it's done. Um, and the implementation is in here. This is a view component. And we've imported it up here just from our like uh, ally package. We have a, I think this might be the, the main, um, the main like uh, mix in that we have here right now. This is like a work in progress. Um, so we're just using the mix in here and we're passing in an HTML um, element and then the message that we want to display. So it's basically saying like, if this name already exists, we want, we want them to know like you can't do that. Um, I'll turn on my screen reader now so y'all can see exactly what that would sound like. Accessibility options. Voice over on application. Chrome, political pro vertical line, project vertical line, personal, Google Chrome, window, all types, add folder, button, close, dialog, close, enter name for new folder, edit text, app double, new, I, app T, L, L, T, save, button, this name is already in use, new list, contents of edit text, space, three, three. So, um, obviously the, it, it alerted right away. Um, I'll go back and change this because we're also using this alert save for when it's button. successful. Um, you are currently save. on a button. To click this button, press control success. The folder has been created. And voice we, over off. So we want this message to show up whenever, like immediately. Um, we don't want the user to find out like in a few seconds that they did something that was invalid or that the, it wasn't successful, a uh, successful save. So this helps us um, kind of have an assertive um, let's see, like an assertive um, ARIA message and that things can be alerted on the page. We can use it multiple times on the same page. Um, and it's really helpful when we're attaching this message to something that is not directly related to what the person is interacting with. So the ARIA, the alert came after I clicked the save button, but we're alerting it on the um, the input kind of. So it's not directly attached to that button. We want to let them know which input um, needed attention. Um, let me check the chat if there are any questions. I actually don't know how to check the chat on here. You're good. Yeah, no no questions okay. at this time. <laughs> it's so cool um, to see that though, Liz. Like it really is neat. Like, and it's, it's that awesome developer moment when you actually make it happen, like to actually see it work. It's really cool. Yeah, for sure. We use this all over, like throughout our repositories. There are a lot of forms and things like that, error messages that we would want to show um, at various points. And this has really made it helpful for us to not have to rewrite that one little thing over and over again. Um, let's see. Uh, the next thing, 
uh, I want to go over kind of is view accessible selects. This is actually a public um, repository that I won't make Jack talk about it, but he has done a bulk of the work to make this, um, to create this and make it public. Um, it's open source. We've had people contribute it, contribute to it um, outside of Politico, which has been kind of exciting. Um, but basically, we um, the native HTML. This is uh, an accessible select, so a drop down that you'd see, or an input that you can select multiple options. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. But um, the reason that we wanted to um, create this package and make it open source is that um, we couldn't find an existing package that that fit our requirements that we thought was accessible enough. Um, we use a lot of drop downs, a lot of selects from like all over our site. So this was like a common UI pattern that we needed to make as accessible as possible to reduce the amount of accessibility bug tickets we were getting and to make this a, make it a better experience for our users who use screen readers and rely on that. Um, Custom select components, custom dropdowns are, um, are really hard to make accessible. Obviously the best route is to do the native HTML select component, but it's not that beautiful. Uh, we, we don't think that we should have to give up accessibility to make a pretty component. Um, so we uh, created this view accessible selects package and I'll show you that now. Um, it is still a bit of a work in progress and it's very actively um, under active de development. So if you want to contribute to it or play around with it, I encourage you to do so. Um, but here's our implementation here. This is a, a view component. Um, it, it, we allow you to add custom styling and stuff like that. Um, and, it, and this handles like most all of the accessibility. I can show you on this same page what that looks like implemented on our site. So this is using this all types is using our accessible select. It looks nothing like the native select HTML select component. Um, I'll turn my screen reader on really accessibility quick options. So y'all can see what voiceover on application accessible Chrome is like. political pro vertical line project vertical line personal group track select content all deep new edit new edit new edit new Sorry, edit to, new edit new, is, new edit, add folder button main all types filter projects all types it. list box pop up collapsed button. So you are currently one on of the requirements to display a list of options, to, uh, press control, enter, option, space. or return to expand the drop down. All types, one of eight. And it you should read out the, the currently selected the list option. And then you can go up and down with your arrow keys to um, see other like list or options for the select. D document not selected, Make regulation not selected. And it should you tell you if it's selected or not. Inside of a list box, news not selected, analysis not selected. And then you'd need you to press enter to select inside it. Inside of a heading level two, personal. And this one runs another search, so the page reloads. Um, but on a page that, when a page doesn't reload, analysis. the focus would F stay analysis. on here. Filter projects analysis. List box analysis. And it would read out the, the on a text 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 inside of a list item. box. Um, you Leaving this box, entering political pro project, off. Chrome has new window, voiceover off. You should be able to tab and it won't go to the next option. It'll actually go to the next element. That's not the, the, the next element in on the page. That is not the, um, drop down. Um, so yeah, Jack, I cannot give him enough shout outs for this. Um, we actually have a little, uh, demo area kind of that um, you can see the implementation for both the regular select and for the multi-select, which is also um, have, has been super helpful. So this one looks like it has these little um, chiclets and then the remove button um, and it handles all of the focusing, all of the announcements, um, everything like that. So that's been super helpful. It's um, reduced a lot of the bug tickets we've gotten if we can make one like select component and just import it into all of our other ones that use a drop down or a select um then you know it it has made our job so much easier in terms of building accessible features um in this slide i don't know if we talked about going over this one evan um but there's still so like all of this is like evan mentioned we aren't experts in accessibility um there is, this is still a work in progress. I think it always will be a work in progress to be able to build accessible, um, completely accessible components. Um, we 
our next steps, I think things that we would like to improve are automating some of our process. Um, Web hints is somewhat helped with that, but we want to be able to draw some more insights from the errors that we're getting some action items really things that we need to like the action items that we can automatically pull from from the tests and scans that are running. Um, we want to make accessibility not feel like a chore. Uh, we want to build it in so that we're thinking about it from the design and development, and then hopefully no bugs come back. But like the goal is to reduce the amount of bugs that we're uh, generating from building our components. Um, and then I think that we want to continue developing our documentation and building our knowledge base on what is the best way to make a component or a website accessible. Um, that is kind of, those, that's my demo. <laughs> Do y'all have any questions? I've gone this far into the, uh, that was really great Liz. Thank you. Um, we, we do have one question, uh, from Brian, uh, in how our view accessible selects compares to Vutify. I don't think that we had looked at Vutify when we were starting to think about this project. Um, but we did, we did look at some other selects and their accessibility. Um, and ended up on this um, process. Um, can you talk to? Can you speak to any to that at all? Um, I think Jack Jack did a lot of the research, so I he I don't know that if he'll chime in. But um, <laughs> we on our uh, in the README for our view accessible selects, we have the inspiration, um, and this was done after a lot of research into what an accessible component should do and how to build it in view specifically. Um, I think, yeah, this one, yeah, we, we've linked all the blog posts, Sarah Higley. I think she's a Google developer. Is that right, Jack? I believe Microsoft. I don't, Microsoft? I don't know if she's still okay. there, but she was when she wrote this. Um, yeah. So that, that this is like the inspiration behind it is really well documented and researched. And we just kind of took from her, um, it's a good question though. I, I like, there are some very popular uh, view libraries out there. Um, and obviously we wouldn't want to probably import like all of Vutify just to solve this problem. So it made, it made sense to make our own. Um, but uh, I like that um, we have it out there for the, you know, for others to collaborate with uh, on it. And so um, that's what's something that's really nice. Uh, one thing I'll say about WebHint as well that I don't think you mentioned was um, we have a, a Discord bot that is daily uh, putting a message in our um, Discord accessibility channel uh, and reporting the number of errors um, that that we have every day, so we can we can see that track over time each day. Bill has a question: uh, What are some examples of where you may have had to sacrifice accessibility to avoid a different type of problem? It's a very good question, Bill. Um, I have an example for this. Go ahead. Um, Infinite scroll is a notoriously hard um, design pattern to make accessible. Uh, there are dozens of blog posts out there that I read about how um, we, it should be avoided at all costs. Um, we did not do that kind of research from the design stage. So it was um, in one of our design documents and we've since changed to a not infinite scroll. We have a load button now. Um, but that is something that we had to like try our best. We needed to make infinite scroll accessible. It was never completely accessible. Um, it was not like an ideal pattern. Um, and we had to sacrifice the accessibility for a preferred design in that instance, um, which we then brought to the team and said, this is not an accessible design pattern. And we ended up being able to change that down, down the road. And what, Liz is hinting at here is a is a commonly meant, termed as shifting left, moving the responsibility and onus for making uh, this problem space um, more more um, uh, less less tangled, moving it away from the uh, just fixing things at the end of the process. You have put code push to production and you're fixing you know you just a bunch of things you 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 push up after the code is already launched to baking it into the part of the process as much as you're able to having buy-in from design and product to understand that it may take a little longer but it ultimately it is 
um, there's there's a business case for this and there's an ethical case for this and there's a legal case for this. Um, so, you know, we're all in DC, we all work for government in, in, some, in, in some capacity, many of our organizations work with the government or with government contractors. And there is, there is literal legal compliance issue. Brian mentioned earlier, he worked for WMATA, um, which certainly has, uh, there's, there's a legal component there that, that those sites uh, legally must be accessible to a certain degree. Um, but there's also, there's an ethical concern, which is we shouldn't be making things that people can use, that all people can use, no matter what their ability is. We have a sort of mantra, which is that um, everyone should be able to use our, our apps and sites without the help of another person. Um, whether we're successful in that, I, I'm not terribly certain that we are in every case, but we, that's what we strive towards. And then there's a business case for this as well that you can make to, um, to stakeholders, which is like once when you have, when you have more accessible um, applications, it opens up the doors to, to who you can talk to about the, the apps that you create and, 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 and who is able to use them. Is, that's, I mean, there, there is a reason that Apple is so focused on making all of their uh, devices and their, their services super, super accessible as much as they can. And it's, and I'll tell you, it ain't just an ethical one. There is a, there is a very clear and strong business case there to be made. So I think it hits on multiple axes. Um, so thank you all very much for attending. We really, really appreciate getting to share this with you today. Um, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us. I'm not sure if our contact information will be in the, um, in the, in the, the presentation details, but um, we really enjoyed getting to present with you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Liz. It was really awesome. Thanks for um, going through all of that. And um, yeah, we'll make sure that uh, people have a methodology to contact you. Um, I think next up it's Jack with more trivia. Is that right? Do you got another round? Just barely. Nice. Yes, I do. Give me a moment to do that thing where I figure out how to share my screen. So someone, fi someone fill about one minute. <laughs> One thing I'll also add to the infinite scroll discussion is, um, uh, yeah, early in the early days, I remember in a, in a new project uh, we did, pretty much everything was infinite scroll. And uh, I remember having that discussion at some point and saying, this is just something we can't do anymore. And um, in the early times, the response was usually, well, here's this other website and they're doing it. Are you saying they're not accessible? And the answer was yes, <laughs> they're not, it's not accessible. It doesn't work. Hey. And I think, um, I think what was nice, uh, at least at Politico, is we we did get a lot of that buy-in from people above us, above the develop. So something Evan said that was really cool at the beginning that really struck struck a chord for me is that uh, no matter how small you are, you can make a difference. Um, and um, uh, there there is still a limitation to that, right? There is a there is a time where um, people above you will say, "Well, this is more important." And to have that um, from the higher ups to say this is important uh, and that getting passed down to people. And when we would have those discussions about this is not accessible and we're the experts at it, um, we actually had a little bit more control at that point. And that was, that was a big change for us and it, and it still is today. But there's some argument, we gave up that design pattern just because we decided it was just a bad pattern. If you're cited, it was a bad pattern. In general. <laughs> there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of research in the UX, UI literature that that's just a bad pattern. Yeah. So. I wouldn't say you necessarily sacrifice design for accessibility. I think you probably made it better for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right, y'all. Obviously, like, we know why you're really here. And it's for the second round of trivia. Right, because I got to get first place. <laughs> especially to redeem yourself if you recently, for example, came in fourth or fifth or third. Um, or uh, if you forgot to name yourself Rice Man the first time around. Or you were first and you got bumped down to second. Sure, sure, sure. But it only matters what you were at the end. Um, I'll take a brief moment to say thank you so much, Liz and Evan. Yeah, that was great. Song. Really appreciate it. Oh, no! 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 Rice Man! No! Yeah, Rice Man! <laughs> That's two. Uh, oh. I've won two. You have, yes. And you did pretty much the same jump. <laughs> <laughs> no, because oh, it's just a video. Exhausting. Well, that was. Good job, Jack. That, that was really good. That was a journey. Well done, Jack. Well done. 
Um, cool. Let's pass it to uh, Chris to close us out with words uh, well, just that thank, are worthy of you. a Nobel Prize. Thank mm -hmm. you, everybody, for uh, continuing to join us. Uh, we love that we can continue to do these. I don't think we've missed a single month, even with COVID. So nope. uh, just real pleasure to have everyone and um, looking forward to next month. We're going to do ViewConf um, uh, around the same time uh, next month.